Hello everyone, I am Kenshin, welcome to Talking About History. We all know that Hitler's initial beer hall coup attempt to seize power failed, but this incident was the beginning of his future seizure of power. Today we will start with the causes and consequences of this incident. Before the show starts, please subscribe, like, and turn on the little bell. If possible, leave your thoughts. This will help the growth of the show. Without further ado, let's officially start. Hey everyone, let's take a trip back in time and crack open the history books to a wild day in Bavaria. Picture this, it's November 8, 1923, and a fella by the name of Adolf Hitler waltzes into a Munich beer hall. Things get real dramatic real quick when he pops a shot into the ceiling. Yep, that was his grand opening for what he hoped would be a total overhaul of Germany's then democratic setup. He called this the Beer Hall Putsch, a fancy term for a rebellion that starts over a pint, I guess. Only, it sort of flopped right from the get-go. The whole shebang didn't take off as Hitler had daydreamed. The guy got nabbed and thrown behind bars, a bunch of his die-hard pals bit the dust, and his Nazi party got the big thumbs down and was outlawed. Now, you'd think that'd be enough to put a lid on anyone's political career, but here's the twist. This disaster didn't knock Hitler down, it kinda gave him a leg up. I mean, the guy himself said it later on, calling the fiasco of the putsch, perhaps the greatest good fortune of my life. Talk about looking on the bright side, huh, that's some strange kind of luck, if you ask me. Germany in chaotic, weakened state after World War I. Alright, let's get comfy and break down some pretty tough times for Germany, post-World War I we're diving in after the guns have fallen silent and the dust has somewhat settled, but don't expect a pretty picture. Germany's in a rough spot, really rough. We're talking serious food shortages, we mean bare cupboards and growling bellies everywhere. Add to that a mix of violent scraps cropping up all over, with every Tom, Dick, and Hans forming a political gang. The nation's pride, battered and bruised. It's a country in mourning, too, with a heart-wrenching loss of at least 1.7 million soldiers. Imagine, just about every family is lighting a candle for someone who didn't make it back. Fast forward to 1923, and the financial scene is the kind of nightmare you don't wake up from. Hyperinflation, that's money drama where the cash in your pocket might as well be monopoly notes, had the economy in tatters. Get this. You needed a staggering 4.2 trillion German marks to be on par with one single American dollar. Picture that, people are hauling wheelbarrows full of cash just to buy a loaf of bread. Looking to trade your prized cow for a car. That's the barter system kicking into overdrive because money's worth zip. Meanwhile, the middle class is watching their savings go poof into thin air. As if things couldn't get messier, the French and Belgians march their troops in because Germany's struggling to cough up the cash for reparations payments, mandated by that big old gotcha called the Treaty of Versailles. Benjamin Carter Het, a history professor who knows his stuff and penned The Death of Democracy, puts it bluntly, Germany's basically a hot, steaming mess. Enter our man, Hitler, stage right. He's an odd duck, a high school dropout with a painter's dream that didn't quite pan out. But what he lacks in academic diplomas and art skills, he makes up for with some serious chutzpah in getting noticed. Born in Austria, but playing for Team Germany in World War I, he then hooks up with the Nazi party and grabs the reins by 1921. Next thing you know, he's hopping around Munich, stirring the pot with fiery speeches. He's got it in for the Treaty of Versailles, and he's tossing around accusations about the Jews that are nothing but foul air and lies, blaming them for Germany's fall from grace in the war. It's not just a turn in politics, it's like he's flipping the whole table over. The beer hall putsch plot. All right, grab your popcorn and settle in, cause I've got a tale of a plot so wild, it makes soap operas look boring. Picture this, it's the Roaring Twenties in Munich, a place buzzing like a hive with all sorts of political shenanigans. Enter our main character, Adolf Hitler, who's got this big idea, inspired by none other than Italy's top dog Benito Mussolini and his flashy march on Rome. Hitler's grand plan, to kickstart his own power grab right in the heart of Bavaria, Munich, 
to eventually hop, skip, and jump over to Berlin, boot out the Weimar Republic, and crown himself King of the Hill. Looking back, you can't help but think, seriously, that was the plan, but hey, that's history for you. So, on a chilly evening of November 8, 1923, about 3,000 folks were gathered at the Burger Braukeller Beer Hall, hanging on every word of Bavaria's big cheese, Gustav von Kahr. That's when Hitler decided to crash the party. He barrels in, leaps onto a chair, and bam, fires off his pistol into the ceiling. Why? To hush the crowd with a bang. Dripping sweat and drama, he proclaims, folks, the revolution starts now. His crew gets busy too, surrounding the joint, guarding the door with a machine gun, snatching a few hostages, emptying cash registers at print shops, and trashing a newspaper that wasn't sending him any love letters. In a twist right out of a thriller, Hitler pulls von Kahr and a couple of military honchos into a room, leans on them hard to back his coup. They nod along but, plot twist. The moment they're free, they rat him out to the army and the cops. Talk about a backstab. And as if that wasn't enough, Hitler's squad goofed up securing key spots in town, like the army barracks and, yep, even the phone company. Realizing their plans going pear-shaped, Hitler and his gang decide to double down and march through Munich streets on November 9th. But guess who's waiting? The Bavarian state police, loaded for bear. What follows is a shootout, ending with 15 of Hitler's guys, four coppers, and some poor bystander caught in the crossfire all biting the dust. Hitler himself gets a shoulder knocked out of whack, and the guy next to him takes a fatal hit. And yet, despite the fiasco, Hitler walks away, by a sheer stroke of luck, as some might say. Hitler's arrest. In the aftermath of the failed coup, Hitler had to play hide and seek with the police for a couple of days until they finally caught up with him and tossed him behind bars in Landsberg prison, not too far from Munich. At first, the guy was totally down in the dumps and couldn't even bring himself to eat. The German authorities were cracking down hard. They banned the Nazi party, shut down the newspaper, and nabbed a bunch of their big shots. To a lot of folks, it looked like Hitler was out for the count. The New York Times even wrote him off, saying the Munich fiasco had finished him and his Nazi pals for good. But as Hitler stewed in jail, he started to see the silver lining. It made him rethink his game plan. According to Peter Black, a bigwig historian who's dug deep into Nazi history, being locked up taught Hitler a crucial lesson. You can't trust anyone beyond your own crew. Plus, it hammered home the point that trying to overthrow the government with brute force wasn't going to cut it. Hitler figured out that if he really wanted to grab power, he had to do it through more subtle means, like playing the political game. The whole putsch mess and the big trial that followed, where Hitler and his buddies got slapped with charges of high treason, put him right in the spotlight. The media couldn't get enough of it. And thanks to some lenient judges, apparently, one of them thought Hitler was quite the guy, he got to stand up in court and make speeches that made him sound like the hero Germany needed. He totally seized the moment, Black explains. Whenever he wasn't chatting to his Nazi pals, Hitler was banging on about all these German gripes that lots of people, even some Jews, could relate to. Hitler writes, Mein Kampf, during light imprisonment. When the dust settled, Hitler got slapped with a five-year prison sentence, but here's the kicker, he could be out on the streets in just six months if he played his cards right. And get this, the court decided not to ship him off to Austria, where he was technically still a citizen. Their reasoning, well, they argued he felt more German because he'd served in the German army. Sounds a bit dodgy, right? Yeah, that's what experts like Het think too. He reckons the court didn't really have the authority to make that call, but they did it anyway. Imagine if Hitler had been deported back then, it could have changed everything. But instead of moping about his short stint behind bars, Hitler was pumped up and ready to go when he got back to Landsberg prison. He rolled up his sleeves and started scribbling the first part of Mein Kampf, his infamous rant filled with all sorts of pseudoscience junk that paved the way for the horrors to come, like the Holocaust and invading Eastern Europe. Hitler later bragged that without his little holiday in prison, Mein Kampf wouldn't even exist. 
After the trial, it was like a revolving door at Landsberg. Visitors kept pouring in, and Hitler's cell was overflowing with letters and gifts, from flowers to candy. He got to ditch the drab prison uniform, chill in a comfy wicker chair, and even had his bed made for him. In his book 1924, The Year That Made Hitler, journalist Peter Ross Range describes it as the cushiest prison stint you could imagine in Bavaria. After release, Hitler resurges on political scene. So, picture this. It's 1924 and Hitler gets what we would call a real, get out of jail free card. He's out of the clink in just a year, walks free with his chest puffed out, full to the brim with self-belief, and practically overnight he's a household name in Germany. He's got a book under his belt, this Mein Kampf thing, and he's dead set on this twisted worldview he's scribbled down. He jumps right back into action in Munich, and where does he go to make his big comeback speech? The Burger Braukeller Beer Hall, the very same spot where his coup flopped. The Nazis, they were still pretty much a blip on the radar, just a sliver of the votes, peaking at 37% in 32. But wouldn't you know it, by January 33, Hitler's got the keys to the Chancellor's office. Why? Because the lefties were too busy squabbling among themselves and the high and mighty conservatives thought they could keep him on a leash as part of their team. Fast forward 12 years, and the world's flipped upside down, tens of millions dead, including 6 million Jewish lives snuffed out in the Holocaust. Just goes to show, back then, they really let history slip through their fingers.